Hi, this is Bobby Baldwin. I just wanted to give you a few tips on doing a portrait, so we're gonna get started here. I'm gonna give you a demo. I'll put this a little closer, see if we can't get you up close and so you can see what I'm doing here. All right, so what I have here is the um, the structure of a skull. So this is the top of the skull and that's represented right here. This is the bottom of the chin. Um, halfway between the top and the bottom are where your eyes are. Your eyes are one eye length apart, so I'm going to be putting those in. The upper lid is rounder, the bottom lid is straighter, so let me just get started with that. So I'm going to take and put in um, just where I'm going to put the upper lid. I'm going to do the same thing over on this side, keeping the eye and eyes distance in between. So if I were to use a thing, a tool called the divider, the divider is something that has, um, whoops, let's see, I don't have one right here. Let's see, where did that go? Um, so the divider is something with two points. I have an old one right here. D divider is something with two points. So if I wanna go ahead and measure these out to make sure that I'm right or wrong. Now this is something that you can look at your work and when you're having a problem with your eyes or feel like something's wrong with them, it's something, it's a good tool to use. This one came, it's a old, old um, uh, drafting tool just has two points to it um just like that you see that now the the more the more current ones that you can buy at the art stores um have a little black part to them right in here and and they but one of the best parts about them is that they continually move they're tight enough to hold where you left them but easy enough to move. Now you don't want a compass because a lot of compasses um, and they do have a pencil lead and, and that's the difference. You get a comp compass and it's made for making circles and so one of them have lead in them. This one does not have lead, it's just two points and it's meant for measuring. So I use it quite often to double check my, um, my image if I have something going on in my face that I don't like and I want to see what, where I'm wrong and where I'm off. So the bottom lid is going to be, so I have the upper lid and that's a little bit dark, so I'm gonna get that thinner here. And it's a little long on this side, I noted that when I was looking at it. I'm gonna take a little bit of a lighter color and go around where the tear duct is. So the tear duct is another piece of tissue that's off the surface of the, of the um, eyeball itself. The eyeball is a perfectly round circle and this is the skin that lays over the surface of it. So we want to create, when I put the irises in, you'll notice that I'm going to use a, um, a rounding line. I'm not going to go up and show the, um, the top of the rounding line. I'm just going to put it in as though this is my iris right there. Now whatever the length is here, I have to make sure that that beyond the tear duct that that's how much space I have over here. Because if I get too much space here and too much space here, I'm gonna have eyes that are looking like um, they are looking in two different directions. Or if I have too little space here and too little space here, I'll have crossed eyes. So I don't want crossed eyes. So I'm going to go ahead and put this um, in as the outer circle of the eye. The outer edge of the eye tends to have a ring around it. We all have a little bit of a ring, no matter what color our eyes are. So I'm gonna go ahead and do blue eyes today because I feel like they're easier to see on camera. So I'll just go ahead and put my pupil in. Now the pupil is a perfectly round circle within the perfectly round circle of the iris. That round circle is an opening to the inside of the eye. The inside of the eye is protected by how wide open this muscle, which is the color, the muscle is the iris itself. That muscle opens and closes around that, around that um, pupil. So the pupil is just a hole. Um, but it's a dark hole, so obviously we're getting a lot of depth to the color. So I'm putting a little bit of blue in there, a little blue and white, and I'm just going to fill in the space around the dark. Wow. 
Now, I'm going to, um, I don't have enough paint on my iris, on my pupil, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit more back in there and fix those. Paintings are constantly being um, evolving. So when I say fix, it just means that I'm, I'm bringing, uh, renewing the shape. And we are only as good as the amount of corrections that we're capable of making. So that means that if you make a lot of mistakes, be patient with yourself because that's what creates the learning that you will internalize. So just keep working, don't ever get discouraged. Now, this is the highlight in the room. Now, whatever my light source is, it will be represented by the shape of this highlight. And I'm gonna go ahead with the highlight over on my left side in this eye because I want it to have a bright light from the left. That's where my light is in this room. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that right there. And I'm, wherever you put it, you have to put it at the same place. Think about a clock. So if that's at um, 10 o'clock on the left-hand side of the iris, I put it right between where the, where the pupil and the iris meet. The, uh, the pupil, I mean the iris, the eyes are the entry to the soul. And so therefore, you want to make sure that the eyes have a really nice feeling about them and a brightness to them that causes that, um, that feeling that you can look right into somebody's soul. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of a highlight on the opposite side of the eye. The reason we do this is because when this light goes into the eye, it hits the back of the eyeball itself and it bounces back out on the opposite side. Now the, uh, the, the pupil is a hole, so it's going to be brightest right at the edge of the pupil and then darker as it goes around. And um, one of the reasons I don't give, I give this kind of shape on the side, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and round the outside of my eye just a little bit. So I'm going to take a little bit of white to push that edge closer and I'm going to bring it into this side as well. And I'm gonna clean up my outer line of my iris to make sure that my iris looks perfectly round. If I finished this circle, it needs to make sure, I need to make sure that that is really round, otherwise your eyes will look really strange. So I'm gonna put that in there and I'm going to put it in here. Now, when you have, um, when you have an eyelid laying over something, anytime one thing lays over another thing, you'll get a cast shadow. So what we're going to get, and that's why I kept this area dark right in here, because that's part of the cast shadow across the top of the blue eyes. So I can go ahead and blend that just a little bit more so that that blue goes into that area so it's not totally dark. Go ahead and put a little bit more in there. Now I want my blue around the bottom of my eye in this area around this to be darker because remember I'm trying to highlight this area here so that means I want that area darker so I'll put a little bit stronger blue in there, a little bit stronger blue in there and then I'm going to go ahead and sweep that white back into that area again right in here because I want it a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger right in there. And then I'm going to transition. Transition means adding those values that are um, between the two colors that you've already got in there. So it's a slow transition, which a slow transition would mean that I'm going from the darker color to the lighter color um, slowly versus fast. So there we go, we have that right in there. Now, one of the things I have to look at is this width across here needs to match that width there because that pupil is centered in the center of the eye. So that means that if this side's any closer than this side, then I'm wrong. And I'm going to go ahead and pull that down just a little bit more, round out my pupil just a little bit more to make sure that I'm in the center of that eye really well, okay? So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cast a shadow underneath of the upper lid. I'm gonna take a little bit of a darker blue-gray and I'm going to put that color right in at the top of the iris here, I mean, yeah, at the top of the eye, the white whites of the eyeball. I'm also going to darken at this edge because anytime you have a round shape, you need to get darker as you go around. Those transitions have to get darker. 
So I'm going to go ahead and add in a darker value right in this area here and right in this area here. By the way, this is a lecture that I had the honor of teaching plastic surgeons with because they need to know how to draw their, um, their subjects and um, as well as do the surgery to them. So when you are looking for a plastic surgeon, look for somebody who has a artistic talent because that is art that they're doing on you. Um, we all have different parts of our... Um, yeah, our anatomy that we're not so happy with. And so um, some people like to get plastic surgery. I, I'm not going to do it myself, but um, that was just, that was not, not something that I really wanted to share there. So anyway, I hope I edit this part out. All right. If not, no biggie. All right. So now I'm going to add in the crease. Now we have this eyeball itself is... Um, it's a soft tissue and we have hard bone right here. Reach up and touch your eye right now and feel like this, where, right where the soft tissue and the bone meet, in those two areas, you will have some kind of contour. Even though we say, oh, I don't want to, don't put the bags underneath of my eyes. Well, we can get a little bit of puffiness in there, but just don't put any hard lines. Put in a little bit of soft um, pinky colors versus blues and greens, and they'll look better that way too. So I'm going to take a little bit of a darker color now. I'm going to put that into my space between where my eyelid and my eye are. This represents the top of the round of the, of the eyeball itself. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in there. Now, not everybody has this. Depending on the genetics, um, a lot of the um, Asian cultures, uh, there are... There are um, many people who don't have that eyelid at all, and it has to do with the fact that this bridge is lower and this area is lower, so you probably won't see their tear ducts as much, and we will probably have a little bit more space than one eye's length between, because with the bridge of the nose, when it gets pulled forward, the opening between becomes about an eye's length. Now, I have met people who had less than an eye's length there, um, and it has to do with the height of the bridge of the nose at that point. So if they have a real large bridge to their nose at this point, it's going to be pulling the skin tissue back together so you'll get more of the tear duct and less space between the eyes. So I'm going to put in that tear duct right now. I'm going to put in um, right here a little bit of red to represent where that tear duct is. Okay. So um, I'm now going to take a little bit of that color and I'm going to pull it in and transition between the red and the white. I don't want it to be too strongly red within the whites because we want them to look like they have um, nice clear whites at this point. Not everybody does, so you have to look at your person and decide what's part of their character and what's part, um, and is it a temporary thing or is it something that is always there? And I've gotten a little bit of my red into my whites, but that's okay. It's more natural looking because we do have blood underneath the surface of the whites of our eyes, so it will show up in that area. So I'm going to now take a little bit of a darker color around the outer edge of that just so that we get some transition. I'm also going to bring it in as the shelf. We have a shelf above our eyelashes and outside of our whites of our eyes. Um, Many people have just, you will see it from here to here. Mine, you can actually see all the way over. It has to do with, um, it also has to do with trusting. So the more you are um, trusting of a person, the, the lower this lid becomes. Because, and when we aren't quite trusting of other people or we're not letting them into our entry to our soul, which are our eyes, we're not letting them in yet, that lower lid will raise up a bit and protect the eye. And we do it without thinking, but it's a common trait with uh, people. It's something I've noticed especially. Um, so as we learn to, um, as we paint our subject, we really want them to feel as though they are, um, they're comfortable with you. We want the people to look at it as, you know, their loved ones or whoever's looking at it. We want them to feel comfortable with them too. So what we're going to do is we're going to, 
um, lower this lid a bit. Um, and the more trusting we are, the lower it drops. So I could actually drop it just a little bit more by creating more of a V right in that area right there. And then dropping that, you see how much it starts creating this feeling of trust a little bit more than I might have had had I kept it up. See that? Per the person starts relaxing. So I'm just going to bring that around there. When I do that, I now have lost my line around the outside edge of my iris. So I'm going to go ahead and, and put in a little bit more. I'm going to adjust that, darken it up just ever so slightly in that area, make sure that that remains darker. Now I've pulled my eye in just a little bit too much, so I'm going to pull it back out right in there. Just want it darker. Now the, the lower lid also sits on top of the transparent tissue of the iris, so I might darken it just a little bit right at the bottom, right where it reaches and that bottom lid and, and gets in that area. Uh, I want to make sure that I get a nice um, edge to my eye as well, so I'm going to work on this one just a little bit more because I don't have, and I keep getting too much odorless paint thinner in there to or mineral spirits in there to, to be happy with my paint and how it lays in there. So uh, I may have to come back to that area again just in a minute. So I'm gonna go ahead and, now around my eyes, I add a little teeny tiny bit of a green. And this is like an emerald color. So it would be a viridian or a permanent green or a phthalo green and and all I do is I add a little tiny bit of that right on the outside of that line and as I do that what it does is it creates a um, feeling of the transparency of the tissue so I'm going to go ahead and put those in right there and then back in with the white up to it to transition that area there brighter Now you'll notice that there are times where you put it in and your brush might not be small enough, you're not getting enough shadow. Um, what I want you to do is to have several small brushes, um, really small brushes that you can use, that you can keep one that is, um, is dry for the next step you have to do. Right now I'm just using the one brush and I'm going to go ahead and get these areas better because I'm starting to lose it. I keep redoing it. That happens. There we go. Yeah, that, I'm liking that better. There we go. Now that paint over there has dried up enough that I can manipulate it. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to create an eyelash line. So I'm gonna get a little bit of a brown tone and I'm just going to put that color in just to darken up the eyelid line because I want a nice eyelash line right there to make it feel a little bit more finished. And I wasn't talking about the skin tone that I put above the eye. Um, I'm just gonna, I just lay in a little bit of skin tone. What I wanna do is I want to create um, the highest point in my eyelid will be the point above the iris because that the iris actually has a lens on it that bulges out on the surface of the, of the eyeball itself. And so wherever that iris is, we're gonna get a little bit of height in that area that represents the highest point in the upper lid. So I wanna make sure that I get that area high. So again, I told you about the tissue down below and where the bone structure meets the tissue. We're going to have a high point at the bottom of the iris at the highest point of the eyeball itself right in that area too. And we'll, there will always be a little bit of a highlight right around the tear duct right in this area. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my white in before I have any skin tones around it just to, to leave that light. So now I'm going to get, grab a different brush, a little bit bigger. And I'm going to take this color right here 
um, and it's a little bit of a darker flesh tone. So now my light is coming in on the left. I need to remember that. So that means on the right hand side, I'm gonna make my colors cooler. Alexa, volume down. There. Love Alexa. <laughs> All right, we are going in and I'm just going to add that darkness. Now when I come to the nose, now I have, the eyes are halfway between the top of the skull and the bottom of the chin. So halfway between the eyes and the bottom of the chin, we get the top of the philtrum. The philtrum is, is this area right here. This, this is your philtrum. So that point right there, so your eyes are halfway between the top of your skull and the bottom of your chin. And that point right there represents halfway between your tear ducts and the bottom of your chin. Of course, when you're talking and smiling, then it is a little bit lower because your chin is being down, pushed down by your that. So let's go back to this, okay? So we are going to add in a little bit more dark color above the eyes. So I'm going to go right in here. So the darkest place, one of the deepest crevices of the eyes are not only um, the bottom of the nose, we want to get the nostrils in there eventually, but also darkness right in this area here. So we're getting a lot of darkness in there. Um, this side is shadowed, so I'm going to go ahead and round up around the eyebrow and around into the temple. Rounding, I'm gonna go ahead. That should be a little bit lighter color because my light is coming from there. I can push this area down on this side of the eyelid because I want the light to stay on top of my eyelid and this area is gonna be in the shadow. So I'm gonna go ahead and push this area back and this area back and then let that light color stay in between. So when I go to do my nose, I know that I have a shadow that happens from here down to here. If you look at me, it's this area here, right here you see you have a shadow, unless it's a Roman nose. Roman nose would be some, a nose that comes directly out of the forehead to the tip of the nose. This case, we're coming from a point that is somewhat above the eyes, somewhere in the eyelid area on me. And then my light is all the way down to the tip of the nose. Now, I want a um, trapezoid shape that represents this whole area that is down, facing down towards the ground, the bottom of my nose. So I'm going to do that next. So as I start doing this, I'm going to add in that color. It needs to be a cool color because it is shadow and I'm working with warm light in this situation. So I'm going to put in the nose. Now, if this face was at an angle and I was getting less of this side of the face and more of this side of the face, so we call that a three quarter, if that was the truth, then this line would be much more straight up and down and this line would be much more straight stretched out. But if I'm looking Looking at a person straight on, they will be equal because we try to keep people symmetric. Now here's one of the things that I tell my students. Um, if you are, um, if you see someone who is not symmetric and you put in all of that um, information that makes them not symmetric from the start, what you will end up getting is someone who is really distorted. And the reason is we tend to exaggerate things when we know about them. So if you start out trying to make your person symmetric, <coughs> excuse me, and look for all of those things that make them symmetric, if you look at that first, then, then take the millimeter off that makes one um, side of their face a little bit different than the other. That's fine. If you really want to put it in there, then go ahead. Um, generally, it, 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 you know, it's, it's not something that I try to emphasize at all. Um, and I don't, I rarely see that lack of symmetry. I try to flatter everybody who I look at and I'm just looking at what they look like and how to apply that. So here's my little bit of a shadow there. So once you get that trapezoid in, whatever that upper edge looks like, we're going to look for the shadow on the side of the nose, on both sides of the nose. This is going to be, and it's a little bit of a triangle on one side and a little bit of a triangle on the other side. Now this side's in shadow, so I'm going to push that side instantly darker with a cool color that I can represent my shadow. Green is always a great color for cool. Um, purple is another color if my 
if my color is um, too warm, then I can take and put a little bit of purple into the color and then pull it into that. Now I do want the bottom of my nose to be darker than the top of my nose, unless I have a real lifted nose or I have a lot of reflection from down below. We still want it to be darker than anything within our light. So I'm gonna go ahead and soften this color just a little bit, bring it lighter so it's not so exaggerated dark. And it does not have a sharp edge, so I'm gonna go ahead and soften that edge. That was just for the sake of showing you how to draw a nose. Now within this space, I'm going to go ahead and find my highlights. And anytime you reach a shadow, the edge of your light will always be warm. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a warmth of a hot orangish color right at the edge of my shadow, right at my edge of my shadow, wherever my shadow is, I will continue to do that. Um, wherever I go. So I'm going to go ahead and put my light into the center of my nose and I'll show you how the nose is created. So this is a pale pink. It's a little too pink. So I'm going to grab some white and add in, oops, that had purple in it. We don't want purple in there. We want, because the light is warm, we want yellows. Um, purple would be the opposite. So I'm going to take, um, and when you make a mistake, um, as I said before, your, your mistakes are what teach you, so don't worry about them, they're okay. Um, all I'm gonna do is I'm going to counteract that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix right there on my canvas. So if I had some purple in my paint and I wanted to warm it up, I'm gonna take a lot of yellow and I'm gonna take a lot of white and I'm gonna mix right on my canvas until I get the color that I want. Now I can come back in once I put that in and I've mixed the, the color that I didn't like, I can come back in and add even more white into it. And if I just play with the top surface of the paint, I don't have to go down to the bottom and it creates a nice highlight. So I'm gonna take that into the shadowed area on the side of the nose. So this is a transition. We call anything that is a angle away from us that we show. So if you, if you looked at the side of my nose like this, you would see that this is um, a certain size. If I turn towards you, it becomes a shorter angle. So that angle right there becomes shortened. So that's called foreshortening. Same with my cheeks. So this whole side of my face is flat towards you. It's nice and wide. When you turn this way, it becomes very thin. So this angle is foreshortened. So we're looking for how to put those foreshortened angles into the um, painting and make them look accurate so I'm going to go ahead and add this a little bit more all right so I'm going to put this in a little bit darker because I want a little bit of a darker color it can be warm um, this is a little bit of red and green mixed together I like to mix my red and green together to get my flesh tone all right so as I start building this nose, I really want to get that area lighter than anything because I have to prove that this is the highest point within the face. It's the closest to the viewer. So that means I have to put the most amount of contrast into this area here. So I can soften the tip of the nose now and I can bring in a little bit of light between the nostrils and I can also come in now and put in the shadows that are around the nostrils in these areas here and in this area here. I'm gonna use a little bit more of a green tone to get that color going on in there. Let me grab some greens. So right in there, a little bit of a green. We'll also find that the smile line starts at this point. So I'm gonna hint where my smile line will be and I'm going to go from there. So the next thing you need to be aware of is, and everybody's upper lip is a little bit different than someone else's. So it depends on if they have Angelina Jolie, big lips, um, large lips that are puffy, then the upper lip may start somewhere in here. But if they have small lips, it may be longer. So it depends on the size of a person's lip as to how far down that upper lip goes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find a half point between those 
those two and I'm just going to get rid of a little bit of that color, blend it out into the skin tones in the upper lip so that I can just move forward with where I want to put the mouth. I'm going to come down to about that point right there and I'm going to start. So wherever the, the bottom of the filtrum, um, I mean the top of the filtrum starts, that rounding between the nostrils, it lines up with the upper lip. Usually the outer part of the mouth it is the corners are below the iris somewhere in this in this line. Now remember, all of this is foreshortened. All of this is another angle that is moving away from us. So even though we smile huge, our mouth may be going back, but only our two front teeth and our actually four front teeth before our eye teeth are straight forward. Everything else is going back in space. So even though we smile large,